Hello, everyone. Ooh. Will it let me click it? All right. Hi, everyone. So let's first, is my computer going to freeze? Let's first start off with a chapter one recap. So what happened last chapter? My computer. Please. Okay, so we're gonna go over like the who, what, or the who, when, and where. So when this is happening in March of 1932, and something they mention is that it's during the Great Depression. So the Great Depression was a time when the banks in the US failed, millions of people lost their homes, Cal and Pop are one of those people, or more so Pop, because he's in the adult. But um, they lost their home and their farm, and now they're hobos, um, as Cal described them. So they are looking for work and home. Where is this happening? It's happening in the south. They said they're traveling to Rustburg. I don't know where that is, but I Googled it. It says it's in Virginia, but sometimes... Uh, uh, multiple states have the same name city. So we'll see if that's true. So who, who are our characters? Cal. So Cal's 12 years old. He loves to read. He was in sixth grade, but then he says his school closed. So he's not in school right now. Pop. Um, Pop is Cal's dad. He served in World War I in France, and he has a lot of flashbacks from the war that he talks about. Red is a man that was on a horse that Cal and Pop met on the road they were walking on. He was also in World War I, which him and uh, Pop talked about. And at the end of their conversation, he told Cal and Pop that they could stop at his house and Red's wife, Rose, would feed them. That was really nice of him. Again, uh, if I'm reading too fast, change the playback speed. So you go to the settings button if you're um, if this is a YouTube video, uh, you can change the settings, uh, and change the playback speed. 0.75 would make it slower. Um, if you want to make it full screen, click the YouTube button, and then from there you can make it full screen. So let's get into chapter two. Not all that much. Again, I'm going to underline every time I start a new line. <clears throat> There's not all that much wood to split and stack, no more than a cord. But Red's wife, Rose, as big boned as her husband, makes like we got enough done to heat their cabin and stoke the cook stove for a year. Come on in now, boys, she says. I finish washing at the pump. Then I take out my comb and run it through my hair a dozen times, just to make sure my hair is not tangled, but slicked neatly back. Ready, Pop says. I nod and we follow the sweet aroma of home cooking inside i'm served a big slab of cornbread i eat it slow sopping up the gravy from the squirrel stew she spooned into tin plates for each of us thank you kindly ma'am those are the only words out of my mouth the whole meal but they are sufficient to earn me a second piece of cornbread try to be a gentleman at all times I'm guessing that's in part of their ethical code he talked about that they have Oh, there you go. That is a part of the second rule of the ethical code. I do my best to live by it. The sun is just a, f is a few fingers past the top of the sky when we finish eating. So looking at the sun is how people tell time. They don't have a watch or prior to watches existing. <clears throat> There's no time for us to boil up, but rinsing and wringing out our shirts at the pump renders us presentable enough for polite company. The sun is warm enough to dry our shirts as we walk. Off we go, Cal, Pop says, shouldering his bindle. I nod and we start off. Pop is just as tireless when we walk together. Fall away under our marching feet. It is still two hands from sunset when we come in sight of Pop's destination. It's a, it's a small farmstead. It's not within Rustburg proper, but at the outskirts of the little town where there's mostly fields and farms. Pop stops at the rail fence a hundred yards from the house. Between the house and the fence is a field of cotton. 
white plumed stalks wave at us like little hands as wind comes up. Pop is shaking his head. He's studying three hobo signs scratched into the corner post. They are no more than a foot from the ground, not where a member of John Q. Public would look. The first sign, older by the way it's weathered, is a square missing its top line. It's the sort of sign a hobo loves to see. It means this is a safe place to stop for the night. But the second of two signs, more recent, are ominous. That's a good word. That means like unclear. So they can't really tell what it says. The first of those newer symbols is a square with slanted roof and an X drawn through it. So let's try to draw this. Square slanted roof and an X drawn through it. The second triangle is with two raised hands. Oh boy. So those are the signs. <laughs> Dang and blast, Pop says. It's as near to cussing as he ever gets. I nod and look back down the road. Time for us to start padding the hoof. Pop shakes his head. Nope, Cal. Let's see if we can set this right. You stay back of me. We walk up the driveway that leads to the small farmhouse. It has a single story, no more than four rooms by my estimate. I do as Pop says. I stay back, but not too far. If someone suddenly comes out that door with a gun, my plan is to push Pop aside and try to duck the shot. With the, that bag, with that bad leg of his, he can't always move that fast. I take care of you, you take care of me. So I think when it's in italic, this little slanted font, that means it's a, in their ethical code. As we walk, I'm thinking about those signs we saw. I'm feeling perturbed about whoever the tramp was who did the homeowner wrong. This is a person who was friendly to bows before, so hobos, they helped them out but now is no longer open to honest men on the road such as us. The second sign, one of the house with an X through it, meant that hobos were no longer wel welcome. The third one, that triangle with the two hands on it, was even worse. It meant that a homeowner was a homeowner with a gun. Had the one who turned this place unfriendly been a thief, it was surely no real bow. Us honest to Pete hobos, follow the code and work for what we get more likely it was a tramp someone too lazy to work and apt to steal your boots while you were sleeping we're now within sight of the front door so far there's been no barking from a dog or no shout of clear out bums from anyone inside that's good unless they're waiting for us to come close enough to get a better shot at us the screen door opens just a crack, but that crack is plenty big enough for what appears to be a barrel rifle of a rifle shoved through it. Mauser, Pop says. Oh, Mauser, Pop says in his soft voice. Saw too many of them pointing at me in France. He reaches a hand back to stop me from doing anything. Stay back, Cal. I should do something, but what? Go away, you two. You got no business here. Go on now before I shoot you. The only good thing about what was just shouted at us is a woman's high voice. Is that what we heard was words and not the crack of a German rifle? Edith, Pop calls out. That you in there? The barrel on the gun drops. I catch a glimpse of the face peering out the window. Who are you to know my name? The woman says. Her voice is more quizzical than challenging now. It's Railroad Will, Pop says. His voice turns sing-song. Child of the open road, heir to the throne of the wind, the same son of the soil who served by the side of your husband, Sam, in world, in the war to end all wars. <clears throat> Will Black? So that's Pop's name. Pop. The door swings open and a woman comes running out. She throws her arm, arms around Pop, almost braining me with that rifle stiff in her right hand. <clears throat> Pop carefully extricates the rifle from her grasp without removing her arm from around his neck. He hands the gun to me. I hold it carefully. Parade rest. Edith, he says, her feet not touching the ground as she hangs about his neck like some sort of scarf. You are looking well. 
the Edith woman woman leaves go leaves go go of her hold plops down on her feet and reaches up her left hand to push a thick lock of brown hair back over her forehead why thank you will black she says i just speak the truth pop, pop replies they stand there a moment it makes me feel awkward it's as if there's something between them that goes back a ways something they don't seem to need to talk about because both of them know it so well and who is this the edith lady says suddenly turning her eyes on me. Pop swings his chin my way, the gesture he does instead of pointing a finger the way most do. Me, my boy, Cal, he says, the finest companion companion any, any traveling man could hope to have by his side. It makes me proud to hear Pop say that, his voice so sincere. I stand a little straighter, swing the rifle parade, rest up to the shoulder arms, and snap a salute with my right hand. Yes, sir, I say. That brings a grin to Bob's face and an outright laugh from Edith. It's pl a pleased laugh, not her laughing at me. Well, she says, and who taught him that? Give Mrs. Euler back her gun, Pop says in reply. I try to hand her the gun, but she shakes her head. No, she says, smiling at me. You bring it on with you. It's not loaded anyway. I know, ma'am, I say, opening it to show the lack of any shells in its breech. That broadens the smile, which seems to be a natural natural expression on her face. Come on in, she gestures at the door. There's a chicken stew on the stove and a mince pie in the oven as well. More than a widow woman can eat by herself. Oh, so that means her husband died because she's a widow. As we sit at her kitchen table, she small talks about her little farm. How the hired man who comes by three days a week is good enough is a good enough worker how the chickens, Sam's Plymouth Rocks, have been laying their eggs good and regular. How that big field of cotton is leased out to a man she calls Colonel, who pays her a fair enough price for the use of the 60 acres. Pop listens and nodding his head now. He's paying careful attention to her words as if his life depended on them. Whenever she seems about to falter or lifts a nervous hand to push back that thick brown lock of her hair, he speaks a word or two of encouragement. Yes, go on, I see. That is one of the things I admire about Pop. He has a way of paying attention that makes people feel good about themselves. I'm not sure where he learned that, but it is something I intend to emulate whenever I have the opportunity. There's nothing fake about it. Not just pretend. He's not just pretending to be interested, even in things that might seem boring. He just finds people interesting. Finally, Ms. Euler reaches at a point where her words finally run out, like a pot from which the last drop has been poured, like the actual empty coffee pot from which she has poured no fewer than four cups for pop over the last hour. She takes a breath, looks around the kitchen, sighs. Time is at the table. You two go wash up, she says. As I reach for the pump handle, pop holds out his hands to stop me. Sam Euler, he says. Sam Euler, he says, looking over his shoulder towards the house. I wait, knowing there's more about to be said. But instead of speaking, he points with his chin over by the wood behind the house. I see right away what is there. We walk over together. It's a rough cut rock, not smooth granite you see on rich folks' resting places. Local sandstone, Pop says, squatting down as best he can with the, that stiff leg. Cut it himself, carved his name and the dates when he knew he was about out of time. Samson K. Euler, 1898 to 1928. S.K.E., I think. A shiver goes down my back. Those were the initials on the watch I saw in my vision. Pop has a gold watch, watch like that one. It was the gas, Pop says. Sam only had a half lung left when he got back. It was a near miracle he survived as long as he did. Long enough to set up this place up, pay off the mortgage, then he could let go. I reached out my hand to help Pop up. He could do it alone, but then again, as he often says, there are plenty of things a man can do alone, but do a sight better with just a little help. Never met a man stronger than Sam. That biblical name surely suited him. It was him who carried me over one shoulder back to the trench, running, leaping over the shells, 
shell holes and the bodies of fallen men right through the barbed wire, paying no heed to bullets and shells. I would have been pushing up pop poppies in Flanders were it not for Sam. We walk back to the pump. Cool, sweet water comes gushing out as I lifted the creaking handle up and down, up and down. But Pop just stands there. He has that faraway look on his face again. He doesn't like to talk about the Great War. It's too painful for him. Maybe feeling that pain of his is what makes me imagine I was there with him. Though that vision of the gold watch is still bothering me. I imagine it could be a coincidence. But what about the part of my vision where I see Sam picking up Pop and carrying him to safety? There's no explanation for that. No question I could ask about it. But I know I should say something now to bring him back. Pop? Yes, Cal? You saved him too, didn't you? You could say that, he replies. Pop sticks his whole head under the gushing spout. He's done talking. He wipes his face with both hands and slicks his thick black hair back. Then he shakes the water from his hands, making dark spots on the dry red earth to the side of the trough as if he's offering the ground some of that water. Your turn, he says, taking the pump handle. I bend and wash my face and hands as he did, sluicing away not only the dirt, but also as much as I can of a memory of pain and loss, a memory I've somehow shared. We're back at the table again. The two of us are scrubbed to the point where our faces are nearly as red as apples, our fingernails as clean as the usual dirt as the the points of our jackknives can make them. Pop is not talking. He's looking just as I am at the big bowl of chicken stew that Mrs. Euler just placed in the center of the table. The steam rising up from it carries an aroma that makes my mouth water. But I have to wait. <clears throat> my father and I are civilized travelers of the highways and byways and not low-life scrounges. Grace comes first. Ms. Euler and Pop are each waiting for the other to say the words but neither seem ready to pipe with a blessing or pass the burden of saying grace to the other. Go ahead, Miss Euler finally smiles. Creator, Pop says, his voice deep and resonant. We three who have granted, who have gathered here together, here give, oh, sorry, we three who have gathered here give thanks for this food, this gift. We thank the bird that gave us, gave its life, the plants that also allowed themselves to be sacrificed to feed us. Pop pauses, takes a breath. <clears throat> we are thankful for the good company around this table and for the everlasting love that still echoes through this home, the love of a good man and a good woman. We are thankful for the brief time we will shelter here in this blessed place before we set our feet again for that long path you've placed for us to travel. Again, he pauses. Though I do not look up, my eyes glued to the bowl as he speaks. <clears throat> I can hear soft drawing in of breath from Ms. Euler, and I'm pretty sure there's a tear or two in her eye. Amen, Pop says. Amen, you say. <clears throat> I'm halfway through my second bowl when I feel something wrapping itself around my leg. I don't jump except in my mind. The last time I felt something like this, was at a jungle camp near the railhead at the outskirts of Tucson, Arizona. Two months ago, it was Pop and me <clears throat> having ridden the rails south to escape the harshness of northern winter by seeking that balmier climb. A feeling like a long hand pressing on my ankle, moving around up, <clears throat> tightening, then a soft hiss. Don't move, son. Pop whispers, I heard it. I opened my eyes to look down, lifting my head only a hair. All I saw at first was Pop's shadow figure crouching, outlined by a low glow of the campfire behind him. Then he struck a match and chuckled at what the light disclosed. It was a sneak, all right, a big one, but not. But even in the small amount of light cast by the Lucifer, we could see its smooth tail and the shape of its head. It was not a rattler. <clears throat> bull snake pop said his hand gently uncoiling from the from around my calf come to warm itself up some it wrapped around his arm its head raised to look at him as he lifted it it was a good six feet long thick bodied and black as jet its eyes 
caught a gleam from the fire that made it seem as if they were filled with stars. I reached out a hand and stroked the big bull snake's back. It hissed again, a sound I took as approval. For some reason, Papa and me has always have gotten along with snakes. Most fear them to the point of hysteria. But as Pop says, snakes just want to go their own way. Though, to be honest, I would far prefer that their way not lead into my bedroll. Pop placed the bull snake on a blanket off to the side, spot where off to the side, a spot where the fire's warmth would be felt. You keep watch, he said to it. We keep you we give you heat, you keep us safe. Then the two of us settled back down and slept the night. One thing about bull snakes is that they tend to discourage rattlesnakes from coming around. Not that Pop nor I feared rattlers all that much. Rattlers are an honorable honorable source sort of snake, generally warning you before they strike, but a bite from a poisonous serpent that responds after being stepped on or rolled over onto by accident is just as bad. This time though, what's happening itself around, what's wrapping itself around my leg feels different, especially when I hear a sound that, that tells me the one paying attention to me is no snake. Meow. Rudy, you stop that. She reaches under the, she reaches down under the table and pulls a fat purring tabby up on her lap. So a tabby is a kind of cat, tabby cat. No manners, she said, but I spoil him. Typical widow woman and her cats. Rudy glances at Pop and then me, a self-satisfied look on his broad face. 23 pounds, Miss Euler says, about breaks my back to lug him about. Doesn't it, you rascal? Dinner is now finished, including a sweet-tasting mince pie. Pop leans forward to look toward Miss Euler's back. There's a quizzical look on his face. Will Black, she says. What are you staring at? Pop shakes his head. That pie was so heavenly. I thought for sure it had been prepared by an angel. I was just looking for your wings. Miss Euler laughs out loud, and Pop and I join in the laughing. That sort of gentle joshing is typical of my father. It is one of the reasons why those who know him are always glad to see him appear. Ms. Euler rubs her face with her apron. It feels good to laugh again, she says. I am right glad that you and your boy stopped by Will. You know, Sam never stopped talking about you. Pop looks down at his hands. I wish I could have seen him more often, but he pauses a moment before speaking the words I've heard him say hundreds of times or more. We never know where life is going to take us. True enough, Ms. Euler agrees. You've been having trouble with tramps, Pop asks, saying that last word as if it brings a bad taste in his mouth. Indeed, I have. But how did you know that, Will? Pop does not mention our hobo signs. No need for anyone outside of our society of knights of the road to know. Well, he says, getting welcomed by a barrel of a rifle was a bit of a giveaway. Steal from you? Ms. Euler nods pressing out her lower lip as she does so. Three chickens thus far, my best butcher knife and that I had left on the back porch, and an iron kettle I could ill afford to lose. How long ago? The tone of Pop's voice has changed now, from idle questioning to focused intent. Two weeks ago was the first chicken. I would have thought it was a fox or a weasel if I had not seen the footprints around the coop. The knife was next to vanish a day later, day or so later. That was when I started keeping watch and keeping Sam's gun at the ready. I used to not mind someone coming through offering to work for a meal, but after that knife finished, I started doing what I did to you, warning anyone away before they got close to the house. They might have been honest hobos, but I felt I could not take the chance. Shame you had to do that, Pop says. I can hear anger below the calm surface of his voice. And when did that kettle turn up missing? Two days ago. Ah, Pop says. I know what that means. We are for certain going to do something. End of chapter two.